This is FRM part two, book one, market risk measurement and management and the chapter on volatility smiles. This is really a, just a continuation of what we've been talking about over the last couple of chapters. You know, let, let's, uh, let's imagine that we live in a world where risk parameters are fixed and constant and known by all participants. Well, we got to eliminate lots and lots of risk management concerns because we would all know what the measure of beta is or the measure of standard deviation is, and then we could just use it in our models. However, what we do know um, is quite simply that betas are not stable, and in particular for this series of chapters, standard deviations are not stable. I mean, we know that they're relatively stable during some short time periods, but we know standard deviations rise and fall over time. And so that's really what these learning objectives address. We're going to define volatility smiles and volatility skews, which we've done a long, long time ago in an earlier chapter. We'll go ahead and talk about the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model and put call parity. And then we're going to look at the shapes of these volatility smiles for both equity options and for currency options. Um, and then we're going to end with a, just a short discussion on those uh, Greeks from the option pricing models. All right, so let's go ahead and just reintroduce this concept of standard deviation and why it's important in this particular chapter. What do we remember? We remember, of course, that standard deviation measures total risk, total meaning that there's, there's nothing else out there. It's, it's a total measure of total variability. And one of the great models uh, that uses standard deviation as one of its inputs is, of course, the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. And these three guys made a couple of really important assumptions way back in, you know, around 1970. The first one was that volatility of the underlying asset, whether it's equity or currency, as it is in this chapter, is known and constant. In addition, they assumed that returns on the underlying asset are normally distributed, which then translates into stock prices being log normally distributed. And what I thought I would do in this first slide is just remind you of that Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. There, there's the formula for the call price. And it's really, it's really quite a simple model here in this form. We're really taking the difference between the asset price and the present value of the exercise price. And both of those are weighted by probabilities. That's what that ND1 and that ND2 are in, inside of the equation. So it's really just a probability weighted difference between what you would have to pay on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for a share of stock and what you might decide to pay for that same share of stock at some time in the future over on the options exchange. Now, the reason that I give you this formula is so that you can, you can look at the equations for D1 and D2 and notice that there is an SD in the equation for D1 and an SD in the equation for D2. So I want you to visualize taking those D1 equations and then substituting them above so that you have this gigantic formula, this gigantic equation. And then I want you to consider the following. Look at those, look at those Black-Scholes-Merton input variable requirements. We need the asset price. We need the exercise price. We need the risk-free rate of interest. And we need time, right? Those are four. Those are four that we know. And then going down to the D1 and the D2, we also need standard deviation. However, notice that Black-Scholes-Merton assume that that standard deviation is known and constant. All right, so let's take a deep breath and say to ourselves, all right, Jim, we know that it's not known and it's not con uh, constant. Then how can we manage that? Well, if you substitute those, those formulas into the above equation and you observe that call price, I mean, all you got to do is go to the options exchange and you can see that price. So you have all of those variables and you're going to solve for that standard deviation. That's called the implied volatility uh, of a particular option. Let me just tell you a quick story. Years ago, 
I took my students to the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, which had the Philadelphia Options Exchange in the back room. And it was very exciting to go back there. And as we were watching these traders, this one guy was looking at this little screen and he was looking at the bid and ask prices and looking and looking and then he'd, he'd uh, execute a trade. And I asked him what he was doing. He goes, hey, this is our proprietary version of the Black Shoals Merton Option pricing model with their estimate of, of that volatility. So I tell my students all the time, the cool thing about Black Shoals Merton is that it is being used or at least a version of it is being used uh, even today. My point is of the story is that that trader on the Philadelphia Options Exchange proved, look at that block point there, it is generally accepted that these assumptions do not hold in practice. So of course, there's some anecdotal evidence, but there's lots and lots of empirical evidence that show that they, uh, they do not hold. In fact, um, what we find is that volatility is a function of time and the exercise price of the option. And that's really what the title of this chapter is, A Volatility Smile. So before we even look at uh, any of these details, just look at the, uh, what is that, a shaded blue line? And what does it look like? Of course, it looks like a smile. And so the interesting part there is notice the circle right in the middle. That would be an out. Uh, I'm sorry, that would be an at the money option. So whatever that exercise or strike price is, the stock price is the same number. That's an at the money option. And so if we go over to the vertical axis with that implied volatility, which let me just remind you, we uh, estimate that implied volatility solving for that standard deviation in the Black-Scholes-Merton model. What we see is that volatility increases when you when the stock price moves away from the strike or the exercise price of the option. And that's really fascinating. So think about this. Volatility, implied volatility, is minimized when the stock price uh, or the underlying asset price and the exercise price are the same number. <coughs> Excuse me. But then what happens as we move to higher and higher strike prices then we worry about the moneyness of the particular option. So notice what I have underneath the volatility smile for in the money puts and out of the money calls that volatility increases with stock price. But for out of the money puts and in the money calls, that volatility increases as the stock price, I'm sorry, as the strike price falls. So that's probably a, a good little four parts to memorize to answer an exam question. Now, what happens if we're not smiling? What happens if we're frowning or we're smirking or we're doing something else? And so that volatility smile, that kind of looks like a perfect smile in which, you know, the left side of your lips and the right side of your lips are, are pretty much the same at the same point on the vertical axis. But what happens? What happens if you, you know, I'm not really a good actor, but what happens if you do something like that? You get this volatility skew. So this is really interesting. So note over on that right hand graph, uh, as the strike price goes up, volati volatility continues to fall. So a volatility skew is kind of like it's kind of like a down a downward slope and notice notice that that volatility the implied volatility is highest when the strike price is is relatively low now that could mean for options that are way way in the money or way way out of the money depending on whether they are uh, puts or calls but the textbook references the 1980s that um, investors were willing to overpay for protection against stock price drops, which means that we're overpaying for put options, right? Because uh, most institutional and individual investors, when they want to protect the value of their portfolio, they do they execute this strategy. And we've talked about this before called a protective put. Some people call it portfolio insurance. And so what happens is that investors assign more volatility to the downside than to the upside. And this goes back to, you know, some behavioral issues that we've talked about in the past is that 
you know, individuals tend to dislike bad news more or bad outcomes than they like good outcomes. Now, the chapter goes into some really good detail about how we can use the relationship between put options, and call options, and equity securities and fixed income securities to kind of get a better handle on this issue of the instability of standard deviation. So what I did is put the put call parity equation right there in the blue box. And so we did this before, but let me just quickly remind you that if you own the stock and then you own the put option, that's the stock price plus the put option, those payoffs on the expiration date of the option are identical to buying a call option and buying a bond that has a maturity value that is equal to the exercise price of the option. And of course, when we raise it, when we take E raised to the minus RT, we're taking the present value. So that's what I have in a note underneath there. Uh, the X E raised to the minus RT, that's the present value of the exercise price. And of course, as we're relating these in put call parity to the performance in different markets, that's going to be the price of a zero coupon bond. Now, what we can do is we can do some rearranging of this put call parity. You might remember that we called this synthetic pricing. We're not really going to do that today. We're really just trying to figure out some of these relationships. And so no, notice what I have in those first two equations up there. I've got uh, <clears throat> call and put market prices, which we can observe. And then in the second equation, I have call and put Black Shoals Merton <clears throat> estimated prices. So that's equation one and that's equation two. And if we subtract those two, we ought to get zero, right? If the model works perfectly. But what did we say? Some of those assumptions in the Black Shoals Merton option pricing model, we didn't really like. And we didn't like them because they probably didn't reflect the reality too much. So we're probably not going to get zero when we subtract those two equations. Now, if you do the quick algebra, the present value of the stock price. And oh, by the way, notice I have the stock price, then E raised to the minus QT. That Q is for a dividend paying stock. Q is the dividend yield. So when you take you subtract those two, they drop out and then you subtract the present value of the zero coupon bond, those two terms, they, they drop out. But what you're left with then is that the uh, price of the put option, the difference between the price of the put option, the observed market price and the Black Shoals Merton option price, that must be equal to the difference between the two calls. All right, so here's what we're deciding. The dollar pricing error when the Black Shoals Merton model is used uh, should be the exact same as the dollar pricing error when the used as the for the puts and the calls. Uh, and in fact, what we see is that they're probably not true. When we look at some empirical evidence and we take the difference between, look at the dotted line there, that's the log normal distribution. And then the, uh, the full line is the implied volatility. And so notice the implied distribution of all of these implied volatilities, it has a higher peak. And then down at the bottom, you can see, I mean, it's not too obvious in this graph, but you can see that it's going to have heavier tails and, and probably wider tails. So this has great implications for all sorts of stuff that we do in financial risk management, not least of which is like a, like a value at risk and all that stuff that we did. And we had so much fun doing, what was that, eight or 10 chapters ago. Now let's switch over to currency options. Um, once again, there's, there's the volatility smile. And once again, we have in the money puts and out of the money calls over there and out of the money puts and in the money calls over here. But remember that pricing of the underlying asset of a currency is way different than the pricing of an underlying asset when it's a share of stock. Let me just give you a quick example here. You know, 
suppose we buy a share of stock today for 100 because we like the quality of the assets uh, generated by this particular publicly held corporation. And we like its weighted average cost of capital. Let's go back to all that stuff that Medigliani and Miller taught us about corporate finance. So we buy this at 100 and next year it goes to 108 and then the following year it goes to 119 and then 133 and then 150 and then so on and so on. I mean, we intend to buy shares at 100 and we hope that they continue to rise over time. And lots of equity securities do in fact rise over time. Of course, if you smooth out, you know, some of those humps. Well, there's never gonna be any reversion to the mean at least systematically in stock prices. I mean, there will be in stock returns, but probably not stock prices. But think of how different that is for a currency. Let's suppose, just for argument's sake, that uh, the relationship between the US dollar and the Canadian dollar is, is unitary. So it takes one US dollar to buy one Canadian dollar. Well, what could happen to that exchange rate over time? I mean, it could take 110 and then 115 and 120, but it's never going to continue to go from one up to two and three and four and five. And that's because the value of one currency in terms of another currency has a lot to do with the following variables. I mean, I teach this to my students that, you know, in general, you have to take a look at the difference between the size of the two economies of the two countries. But then you have imports and exports. So you have this notion of of international trade. And that is should be the driving force between and among exchange rates over time. And so what do we know? Sometimes we have imports greater than exports. Sometimes we have imports less than exports. So that means that if it's a dollar today, unitary exchange, it might go up a little bit and then it might come down. It might So it's going to hover. There's a greater chance of reversion to the mean in that particular in that particular example. Now, of course, now, of course, exchange rates ought to be determined by supply and demand conditions, but we have this other, this other matzo ball out here, and that's the government. So what do we know governments do to affect exchange rates? Well, we're living through the age of tariffs these days, you know, tariffs and pegging currencies and uh, central banks intervening into the uh, equity, I'm sorry, into the uh, currency markets, not to mention uh, central banks who are buying and selling and keeping, keeping, in tra keeping track of the money supply of each individual currency. And so uh, what has to happen here is for us to take just a little bit of a different look on this volatility smile. And so we have to conclude that the options that are way, way in the money or way, way out of the money, depending on whether it's uh, call or a put, those things imply greater implied volatility, then it must be the case that the currency traders anticipate a higher probability of these extreme price movements than is predicted by that original model. And that should make some sense because what do we know? We know that there are lots of hedgers and there are lots of speculators in the currency markets. And so if there are lots and lots of extreme changes in the value of that underlying asset, the U.S. dollar per the Canadian dollar, then corporations and governments and maybe wealthier individuals are going to have a different outlook on those way out of the money and way in the money call options and put options than for those at the money options. And notice my last circle point there. This proposition is supported by the empirical evidence. And here's a table that is used to indicate that. So going down the left-hand side, we have standard deviations. And what we're trying to do is look at uh, daily movements of currencies in 12 different exchange rates over a 10-day period. All right, so in the real world, we can observe that 25% of the days out of a year um, fall within one standard deviation, and then 5.27 and 1.34. So as we, as we observe in the real world, all the way down to six standard deviations, and by the way, you really have to scratch your head and say, what in the heck is a, uh, what the heck does six standard deviations mean? I'll leave you guys to try to figure that out from, uh, you know, from just kind of a personal experience.
The log normal model, however, I mean, look at that far right column. When, once you get to, I mean, after the first standard deviation and the second standard deviation, I mean, we're relatively kind of in the same ballpark, but then we really fall off. Notice the log normal model predicts, you know, no days, no days occurring within six and five and, and, and almost four standard deviations. Ah, so what does this tell us? This probably gives us some sufficient evidence that there is a volatility smile in options on those uh, on those currencies. Now look at my uh, look at my first block point. Equity option volatility pattern is different from the currency option smile, and so the pattern is more of a smirk, indicating indicating a higher implied volatility for low exercise price options than for higher exercise price options. And this, this is what the empirical evidence shows. Ah, so let's go ahead and read that one. This, this means, this must mean that uh, traders in the markets expect large down movements in price that are greater than large up movements in price. And of course, we're comparing this to the log normal distribution. Now, I need to scratch my head here and ask the question, is this because of some behavioral finance and behavioral economics possibilities? Remember that uh, we have this thing called loss aversion, which is very different from risk aversion, is it? So that we really dislike losses more than we enjoy gains. So there's Jim's kind of initial observation for why this might hold true. However, the chapter doesn't mention that at all. It gives these two reasons here. And these are pretty good reasons. Capital structure leverage and worrying about stock market crashes. Um, you know, when you have changes in leverage, let's go back to Medigliani and Miller. Those two guys taught us that capital structure of a firm is irrelevant in determining value. Now, of course, they had lots of assumptions in their model. And when you relax some of those assumptions like tank taxes and financial distress and bankruptcy costs, we, we do get something like an optimal capital structure. And what happens then is that firms are always trying to find this optimal capital structure, but that optimal capital structure depends on the market value of the debt and the market value of the equity. And so if in fact, for some reason, maybe it's firm induced or maybe it's market induced, when the equity value decreases, well, that must necessarily mean that leverage increases. Of course, we measure leverage by the debt equity ratio. So higher leverage then, then means higher volatility. And then the other side of this goes back to what I was saying about the protective put and the uh, insurance policy, so to speak, of using um, put options. So the higher demand for out of the money puts results in a higher implied volatility. And let me just give you a quick example. You know, if you have a if you have a stock price that's 100 and you're worried about a crash, you're going to buy a put option. Now, what you can do is you can buy a put option that has an exercise price of five dollars. And what it's going to do is establish a five dollar floor for the value of your portfolio. And that's going to be really cheap. It's probably going to be almost free. Right. But what's the difference between zero dollars in stock price and five dollars in stock price? So what traders try to do, what investors do is they'll pick an out of the money put option. So what did I say? Stock price is 100 investors might say, you know what, I want to put a floor on my portfolio of, let's say, $90 or $80. So those out of the money put options are relatively cheap, but there's lots and lots of demand for them. So the price is going to do that, right? I mean, investors tend to not say something like this. All right, my stock is trading at 100. I want to buy a put option that has an exercise price of 120. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that option, of course, would be so, so expensive that you would never engage in that kind of, of a trade. Now, of course, professionals out there and academics as well are always looking for refinements and sophistications to try to come up with a better estimate and a more accurate description of these volatility patterns. And so the chapter talks about uh, 
three different alternatives. Now, in these studies, the exercise or the strike price is almost always the independent variable in, in some kind of a study, whether it's correlation analysis or regression or multiple regression. And so what these uh, professionals try to do is come up with a better, a better variable so that we can explain all this other stuff out there. And so let's suppose that we replace the strike price with a ratio, the strike price divided by the stock price. So notice that that strike price then divided by the stock price changes over time. So you get more of a sense of a measurement of what's happening in those two markets. And so it shouldn't be surprising that that resulting volatility smile is more stable. But here's an interesting one. Let's replace the strike price with the strike price divided by the forward price for the underlying asset, right? So that strike price today, that's, that's, that's given, right, by the exchanges or by the writer of the option. And when you divide by the stock price, that's determined by what's going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And that thing changes every day, right? So we liked alternative one. But how about if instead of using today's stock price, which is a present value in and of itself, we compute the forward price or the future value? Because on the exercise date, I'm sorry, the expiration date of the option, the forward price is what you expect to pay for it today when you buy the option. All right, so this is likely to give us, you know, maybe a better estimate. And then the third alternative can be replacing that strike price with the options delta, right? So the delta measures how much does the call price change when the stock price changes. And by the way, that's one of the really awesome things about the Black Scholes Merton option pricing model is that remember I said those were probability weights and those probabilities have to be between zero and one. You know, the notation is the capital N D1 ND1 and that's uh, that's going to be a probability, but that's also that's also the options delta. So you can easily use Black Scholes Merton to come up with that option delta. Now, just like our conversation back with interest rates, where we said something like, "Hey, look, if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna ask me to lend you money money over a day, I'm gonna charge you an interest rate. But if you ask me to lend you some money over a year, I'm gonna charge you a different interest rate. Maybe it's gonna be higher because I have to give up liquidity or a host of other reasons that we talked about during the term structure of interest rates. Well, we can do the same thing with volatility. We call this the volatility term structure. And so those implied volatilities are a function of the time to expiration for those for those option contracts, right? So we can have an option that expires, you know, next week and next month and next quarter and next and next. And so we have all of those volatilities. So that term structure is just a curve. I mean, it could be upward sloping, it could be downward sloping, and it could be something else. But if it is upward sloping, that means that long-term options have greater implied volatility than short-term options, which then must mean that that short-term implied volatility is expected to rise. And that's really what we've been talking about here is trying to figure out what volatility is going to be at some time in the future, like tomorrow or next week. Because if you knew if you knew what the standard deviation is going to be, let's say next Monday, then boy, you could make, execute a lot of trades today and be extremely wealthy by the expiration date of those options. Now, volatility surface is simply a combination of the smiles with the term structure. And here's a table that illustrates, you know, we have, uh, we've, the, it, it illustrates this relationship. So we've got maturity expirations on the left-hand column. And then we'll take a look at that volatility smile. Notice we go the strike price divided by the stock price. What was that alternative one? So we just go from 0.9 up to 1.1. And so notice that in those earlier expiration options, you have way difference between 
the at the money options that would be right that would be a one volatility smile one that middle column so over there in in red i've got a big smile right but when you go down below to five years you're really comparing 13 and a half and 14 and 13 and a half and 13.8 i mean look i i, I can't argue, you can't argue with the math at 0.9 volatility smile uh for five years it's 13.8 at 1.1 volatility smile is 14, both of which are greater than the at the money option of the 13.5. And so that's just kind of like a little, you know, a little, I don't want to call it a smirk. So here, that top one, so think of it this way. If you ever get to the, an exam question like this, for those shorter term options, that's like your team winning the Super Bowl, right? And for down at the bottom, for those longer term options, that's like your team just winning a regular season game. So you're happy. So it's just a little upward slope on either side. So you're happy. So you're smiling just a little bit, but you're not showing any teeth, right? When your team wins the Super Bowl, you're smiling from ear to ear and you can't contain your joy. Now, how about the calculation of these Greeks? And we spent some time a while ago talking about uh, the Delta, which we just did just a few moments ago, and Vega and Gamma. And so, of course, of course, these volatility smiles, they're going to impact the estimate of those Greeks and then and then how you can use those Greeks to hedge. Remember, that's really the cool thing. The Delta tells us by how much a stock price, I'm sorry, by how much the call price is going to change when the stock price changes. So if the if the Delta is 50, let's say an at the money option 0.5, what you know is that if the stock price goes up by a dollar, and this is a call option, stock price goes up by a dollar, then the call price is going to go up by 50 cents. So you arrange as a good financial risk manager, you arrange a hedge for your client or for yourself based on that delta of 0.5. But that delta of 0.5, that's estimated based on the Black Scholes Merton assumption of constancy and fixed and all that kind of good stuff. And it's pretty much the same for a one month and a five year option. But we just know after the last 30 minutes or so of our discussion that that's not true. So I really like that second block point. Volatility smiles complicate the calculation of Greeks. And then I'm going to put a comma in there. Comma, of course, it complicates the implications for all the hedging strategies that we want to pursue, whether it's for the Delta or for uh, Vega and volatility or Gamma or any, any of those other Greeks, right? So the textbook tells you guys about a couple of rules. Sticky strike rule. And so this simply assumes that the options implied volatility is the same over short time period. So sticky, sticky strike rule. I remember in my first economics class, way, way back in the early 80s, my professor was telling us that gasoline prices are sticky. And I thought, you know what, that's kind of a clever way to look at it because, you know, as soon as supply and demand conditions change, gasoline stations, they'll react quickly if the price goes up. But if those same events occur in reverse, they're not as quick to lower their prices. So they stick. So they're sticky. And so this, uh, this applies to, to what we've been talking about here. And what we're assuming then is that the probably the Delta and the Vega and maybe the Gamma too that if we're comparing a two-day option and a three-day option and a four-day option, they're probably close enough. They're probably close enough that it's not going to have too much of an impact on our decision rule. Of course, you got to worry about you can't compare a two-day option with a two-year option. Now, the st sticky delta rule assumes that the relationship, the stock price over the exercise price, is constant. And what that tells us is that the volatility skew remains unchanged. Now, one of those learning outcomes asks the question about large price increases, either up or down. So when a large jump, either up or down, is anticipated, you know, there's no way that this distribution is going to look like a log normal shape. So look at the dotted line there that I have on that graph. There's no possible way that it's going to do that. What's probably going to happen is that there are going to be two possibilities. We're going to look this way 
if the price goes up, but we have to look this way if the price goes down. And so we'll call that bimodal. So that true distribution in blue, you know, it looks like uh, it looks like an M. And I have just a quick example there. There is an important news announcement due in a few days. And really the classic example of this is a company that has uh, is being sued by the Justice Department for something. And uh, the judge is going to make an announcement, either guilty or not guilty, in a few days. So if they're not guilty, then the company probably has lots of cash that it's been hoarding uh, in case a judgment was uh, issued against it. And so they can then use that cash to invest in positive net present value projects so stock price goes up. Or if the judge says guilty, then they're going to have to pay out. And then who knows what's going to happen to their stock price. So think about it you know, stock price can go either very high or very low. And so that bimodal distribution is probably some kind of a mixture of two log normal distributions, each corresponding to either the good news or the bad news. Now, of course, it's one thing to observe all this stuff on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, but let's take a step back and say, all right, if on the New York Stock Exchange, we know that price is either, either going to go way up or way down, depending on what this judge tells us in a couple of days, then we're going over to the side market, over to the options exchange. Boy, what, what is going to be the implication? Hmm. This is what we observed. Look at this. This is really cool. At the money options are probably going to have higher volatility because... In the options market, investors are going to say something like, you know, really, how can you predict what a judge is going to rule? Let's buy and sell lots and lots of those at the money options. And so they're going to have higher volatilities. And so, boy, can we call that a frown? Sure, that looks like a frown. So there's the learning objectives recap. Uh, we went through all that stuff.